How exactly did the FBI and members of the Obama administration spy on the Trump campaign? What was the poison pill used to obtain the FISA warrant on Trump campaign advisor Carter Page? And has enough been done to clean house at the FBI? This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kellick. Today we sit down with Tony Schaefer, acting president of the London Center for Policy Research. He served as a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army, where he was a senior intelligence officer. Today he's also an advising producer for National Geographic and a member of the Trump 2020 Advisory Board. So let's talk about what has been known as the Spygate scandal, or also known as you know the Russia collusion scandal in some circles. Um, in short, the FBI used politicized and flawed information to investigate the Trump campaign. Um, they were fed information by a series of people who were actually paid by the Hillary Clinton campaign, including um, MI6 agent Christopher Steele, uh, Fusion GPS co-founder Glenn Simpson, Perkins Coy lawyer Michael Sussman. The FBI then used this unverified information to obtain, I guess, a series of FISA warrants on uh, the Trump campaign volunteer Carter Page. This seems like a terrible thing to, to happen, and it's all very, we were discussing earlier, this has really tarnished the reputation of certain agencies, especially the FBI in this case. Um, what do you think can be done to, to fix that? And there, There's three things that need to be examined in this, uh, and I've had uh, experience in dealing with these sorts of domestic operations. While it's not well known, the Department of Defense has parallel authorities with the FBI regarding what we call foreign counterintelligence. So we, the Department of Defense, do do these sorts of things. Uh, and so w I'm very familiar with the authorities based on having to have briefed these sorts of operations to the National Security Council. So let's start there. Uh, EO 12333 is the foundational document which governs all of these sorts of collection activities. Each agency then takes and has its own implementation guidelines. Uh, within the context of the FBI doing domestic foreign counterintelligence, especially on political campaigns, uh, the, a waiver is required by the National Security Council, in this case it would Susan Rice, to allow for enhanced domestic collection on individuals. That is to say that to have the Trump campaign collected on is extraordinarily uh, hard because in most circumstances, a U.S. citizen, if you're a U.S. citizen and you're being targeted by the Russians, you are obligated to be told. The FBI is obligated to tell you you're a target because you've done nothing wrong. You're a U.S. citizen. The only way you can not have that done is by a waiver at the National Security Council. So everything starts. Everything we're talking about in some form goes back to the National Security Council because those waivers had to be granted. So let's start with that. Once those waivers are granted then, um, we've seen from that allowance, that diversion from policy, for the FBI to have essentially this, this door open for them to do extraordinarily bad things regarding their authority. Um, the FISA system, the foreign in, in, in intelligence uh, collection activities which we're talking about are very powerful. The U.S. government has very powerful technology. I've overseen very uh, complex technology programs which the, Amer the American public has no clue exists. They just don't. And anytime you have these programs, you must have really good oversight so that this power is not abused. My belief is uh, that certain members of the FBI knew exactly what they were doing regarding using these powerful tools of, co of collection, collection and technology against domestic po political threats, uh, what they saw as threats, which were uh, the Trump campaign and others who were essentially endangering the candidacy of Hillary Clinton. Uh, that, that candidacy was jeopardized by twofold issues. First, her use of an illegal uh, email server. Uh, that's an unforced, uh, unforced error on her part. It's still not resolved. Uh, and then, of course, just the fact that political 
forces were challenging her in the domestic political front. So these two things combined, uh, we've now seen the FBI essentially took a side, and they did so, again, based on the waivers they got from the White House. So when you get down to the operational level, to the level of Comey, of uh, Peter Strzok, of uh, Andrew McCabe and these others who were now uh, the overseers of these immensely powerful programs, there was at some point, from my judgment, a decision to allow for what we as intelligence officers never permit, outside information to be used as gospel and hard intelligence facts. Um, I did intelligence collection for over 30 years. And within those operations, unless we, the U.S. government, developed the information through our own independent sources, it wasn't considered valid. You would never take information from a quote-unquote opposition research firm, put it into the system, and say this is validated intelligence. It's never done be for two reasons. First, it's going to be, it's going to be, it's opposition research. So you automatically understand the slant, even if it's factual, is going to be flavored in a certain way to essentially be unusable for purposes of, of, of factual understanding of a situation. It's just not done. Secondly, whenever you do something like that, you have the potential of opening a door to information operations and deception. In this case, in the case of, of, of Steele and his information, it is my belief, based on what I've seen regarding the information collection chain, this was information that was fed to Steele for purposes of upending our, our, our elections. This was information designed by someone in Russia to essentially be a poison pill. And I don't believe the Russians, just for the record, I've said this another, I don't believe the Russians took a side during the 2016 elections. I believe the Russians were trying to upend the elections for purposes of just being Russians. The Russians tried to, to be disruptive in any uh, democratic process. This was no different. So they were in a position to win no matter who became the president. They would win because uh, if Trump became president, they were able to, to, to do some things to undermine his authority. And obviously the whole Russian time, the, the Russian narrative, the Russian investigation has been a huge uh, lodestone on the presidency. If Hillary Clinton had won, they could have done things to say that they undermined uh, the, her legitimacy by saying that uh, they, you know, that she did things to with them, and her election was not legitimate. They were going to win no matter what. Either way. Either way, and the FBI was completely oblivious to the danger of taking in this information, putting it into the intelligence collection system as if it's gospel. So those are the two things I see that were hugely uh, wrong with the FBI doing this. But again, let me emphasize this again. They, they could not have done all of these things, uh, especially not telling Trump about the fact that there was a perception that he was being collected against, if not the White House opening the door for them to do all of this. Because of this waiver? Because of that waiver, yes, sir. By the NSC, wow. So, again, so what, two, two questions. Sure. One is, how can, who can be held accountable for this? How can uh, accountability be, be found? And the second is, what can be done to, you know, rehabilitate, you know, obviously this incredibly important agency, the FBI, you know, which right now is in this tarnished state. Yeah. Well, let me, let me say for the record, I have worked with the FBI uh, three times uh, undercover with them over the past 30 years uh, doing uh, the INF, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. We, I worked with the FBI in Texas where we were in the process of destroying our boosters and the FBI and the Army ran joint uh, teams to monitor the Soviet officers who were involved in observing our activities. I've worked with the FBI uh, against 17 November. Uh, a terrorist group in Athens where we were working right out here at a WFO deploying forward uh, with an FBI team to defeat that terror organization, which notably they defeated that terror organization right before the, the Greek Olympics. And then also in Afghanistan. In my book, Operation Dark Heart, I do document the time we worked together with the FBI. The FBI and, act and I actually in in conducted an interrogation, which ended up uh, breaking, not, we didn't touch him, uh, a, a, a uh, enabler of the IRGC trying to fund terrorist activities against us in Afghanistan. These are all things which I've done. So I have the highest regard and respect for FBI agents. I have no regard at all for their leadership, and many agents feel as I do because of the uh, 
this tarnished image that these leaders have now created for the FBI. So what do we do? First, I think we have to do a full review of everything within the FBI's foreign counterintelligence programs. You have to have a peer come in and do essentially an academic and operational review. Uh, in the Army, we do reviews all the time of, of foreign counterintelligence cases. We have someone with fresh eyes come in and look at it to verify the legality, verify the operational necessity, and, oper and verify the tradecraft. A very simple thing. Uh, someone needs to do that regarding all FBI agents. Uh, I'm arguing that we should have the Department of Defense uh, with their foreign counterintelligence activities do a full audit. And I do mean a full audit, not an IG audit, not a criminal investigation, just an audit. Because if we believe that the FBI took these short, shortcuts, we do know they took these shortcuts for this Russian narrative issue. There may be other things. There's probably other things. So I think we owe it to the American people to do, and the FBI owes it for their own interest to have someone come in and do a look. Okay. They owe it. They, they need to have this done to begin the process of overcoming this tarnished image that they have created. Secondly, and I think equal, of equal importance, is to hold those accountable who broke the law. Uh, there are specific instances of, of uh, Title 18, which uh, some people, like McCabe, have been referred to the Department of, Ju of Justice for violations of that. There have been criminal referrals. I believe that if you examine each player within the context of the play, Comey, McCabe, Strzok, Lisa Page and others, you will find that they did violate directly elements of Title 18. And based on the fact that you need to have a single justice system that doesn't play favorites, they must be looked at for prosecution based on these violations. We know Comey compromised classified information. We know Strzok, for a fact, has been uh, uh, has lied before Congress at least three times. I've talked to members of Congress about the conflicts between what he said in closed session versus what he said in open session. Uh, that's something that's being dealt with right now. So you've got to do both things. You've got to do a full review. Uh, to make sure that the American people can regain a trust by a third party looking at what the FBI did on foreign counterintelligence, as well as now, at this point, examining the full scope of all the, the, the Title 18 felony violations conducted by these officers and investigate them and prosecute them to the full extent of the law. They should not be above the law simply because they were federal officers in the FBI. It gives them no special dispensation for their bad acts. So, you know, one of the things that really struck me as you were speaking earlier, um, of course, uh, this is, we're talking about some opposition research that was used. Right. It's also research that was actually done by foreign intelligence agencies, Correct. at least in part. And so, you know, we had current and former uh, Uni United Kingdom in intelligence agency people basically providing information about Americans. Right. Um, I think many of our audience would see that as gross overreach by intelligence agencies. Right. How do we protect against this? How do we protect Americans against this in the future? This goes back to where the FBI did violate uh, laws or allowed the violation of laws to exist within the context of this. Uh, U.S. citizens cannot deal legally with foreign intelligence op op operatives. You can't do it. The moment you do that, you uh, are in danger of violating U.S. law. Um, there's a number of exceptions that allow for the FBI and the intelligence community to spy on you. One of those is if you're, you are dealing with a known intelligence operative of a foreign nation. That's illegal. That opens the door. Opens the door. But in this case, it was encouraged. This, in this case, the FBI did not say, oh, Fusion GPS, you shouldn't be doing that. They were all in and allowing this to be open. And the second point of concern is the very thing you said. Foreign intelligence services have an interest that is not generally in line with our interests. Even the British will tell you that while we're allies, we're not necessarily in sync on every single issue. They as a nation have their own national security objectives. Some overlap and some do not. So I think this is one of the issues that we have to be aware of when we study this as an after, after the fact issue. Um, the FBI knowingly permitted intelligence uh, operatives from foreign nations with, with objectives which clearly were not in the interest of the United States to allow information to come into our system to be used as fact, which is to this day disrupted our political process and continues to interfere with some people's confidence in democracy. As you mentioned earlier, you know, you, you're, you weren't happy or you're not happy with the top brass 
uh, you know, in the FBI. Right. But actually, a lot of them, it seems, actually have now been replaced or removed. Uh, and and I, I mean, I don't know how many layers, how, how, how deep that goes, but it, it does look like significant action has been taken. How significant is that? Not sufficient. Uh, Director Ray has been reluctant to, I think, go to the full extent of what's necessary to, to weed out the bad actors. Uh, the FBI did not become corrupted overnight. This was, I would argue, a process started under uh, the Clintons back in the 90s, where you had a series of, of individuals over time who came into the senior levels of the FBI who were more legally focused, more lawyers out of DOJ running it rather than field operatives. And uh, look, I, uh, I've been an operative my entire life. I have little tolerance for analysts who want to play at operations. Uh, and I think uh, in, our, in our intelligence community, uh, we have seen huge failures based on analysts coming in to be r uh, uh, in charge of operations. The same parallel exists within DOJ and FBI. Basically, the agents who come through the field have a really good understanding of how to go about in investigating, preparing evidence, and submitting it for purposes of prosecution, or in the case of foreign counterintelligence, how to effectively set up counterintelligence operations to, to, to catch spies. Uh, lawyers who have never had any field operational experience coming in to be in charge and overseeing that tend to politicize the operations rather than allow them to run to the full extent of, of, of what the logical conclusion should be. So what lawyers are to FBI operators, we have the same problem with analysts in the intelligence community telling us as operatives what to do. So this has been a problem and, and over the time. So uh, a lot of the folks we see now running the FBI are very focused on legality rather than success. And the legality they often refer to has been, for example, over the last couple of days, I hope you don't mind m mentioning it, Lisa Page's texts, which were revealed over the last uh, 72 hours, indicate that the FBI was trying to cut a deal with State Department regarding Hillary Clinton's classified emails found on the Warner, Wiener laptop. So they said, basically, if, if you FBI downgrade uh, the classification to unclassified, we'll give you more space in our embassies overseas. That's payola. That doesn't sound good. That is not, no, so, so that's my point, is you have these, and Lisa Page is a lawyer. So what you see is lawyers coming in to manage the process of the whole activity. And so I don't believe for a minute Lisa Page's a actions were reflective of what a field operative in the FBI would have done regarding seeking justice. I, I don't think a field operative would have cared about how many attache positions they have in embassies overseas. They would have done their best as sworn officers, sworn law enforcement, law enforcement officers to follow the information where it was. You bring in people like Lisa Page who have no interest in serving justice, trying to basically cut political deals behind the scenes. That's, this is the illustration of my point. Uh, and when you have this level of, of corruption, uh, you got to weed it out. And I don't believe Christopher Wray has, has, uh, has actually gone in and done this to the level necessary to write the FBI. But do you, do you think he will? No, I don't. I think he needs to be good. I think he is a uh, member of the swamp. I think, based on his actions to date, that he has done what he can to stop the bleeding, but he has no interest in cutting out the cancer that's in the FBI. Okay. Well, actually, speaking of the email server, yeah. so there's also some evidence recently unearthed that uh, some of the emails may have been sent to a foreign All of them, except for seven, yeah. Uh, okay, can you explore that a little bit more for So us? I've actually spoken to the members of DOD who uh, discovered this flaw. The, the, this flaw was discovered by the intelligence community part of the Department, Department of Defense. It was the, the ODNI Inspector General's office, and they did a, a full evaluation. They received the same copy of the email server and all the emails uh, that the FBI had. And the purpose of the, the ODNI, uh, the, uh, the IG who came out of DOD, the, the reason they were doing this review is because they had to make an assessment of the classification of all the email that were, were contained on Hillary Clinton's okay. server. So it was during that review of every email, basically they went through every email, and not only did DOD, uh, the ODNI and, and, and DNI guys look at the email, they looked at the metadata.
So every email, as you know, and your audience probably knows, uh, at the, at the, uh, within the data which moves the email, there's router information that indicates right. who sent the email, when it was sent, how it was sent, the route it took, and anybody else who gets copies of it. So within this very deep metadata review, the ODNI IG discovered that in every email except for like seven were being sent to a third party. That third party was a, uh, apparently, I'm told, a business that, was, that is in Manassas, Virginia, and that business is, was owned or is owned by the Chinese intelligence service. And there was a drop at this place and then it was sent off to, to Chicago is what I was briefed. And what, what's significant about this is not so much that I know, it's the fact that according to the ODNI IG, Peter Strzok, the guy in charge of the Clinton email investigation within the FBI was briefed on this three times. And each briefing, uh, he was presented with this information and the question was, what are you going to do about this? So, and, and by the way, this, was, this is now in congressional testimony. Uh, Peter Strzok did, was asked this question in closed hearings. He gave one answer in closed hearings, and then he was asked again in public uh, by uh, Congressman Louis Gohmert, and he gave a different answer. So this is uh, an unresolved issue. And based on the information I have from talking to people who were directly involved, this was, uh, this was known to the FBI and uh, the FBI refused to examine it as part of their investigation. Uh, to this day, I have no clear understanding of why Strzok did not look at this, but uh, they did pro provide him, that is, the ODNI did provide Strzok the specific investigation uh, uh, data from their investigation which indicated this all had occurred. Can you comment on the national security implications of this? Well, yeah, the two implications are, first, anything that Hillary Clinton had on its server was compromised to the Chinese intelligence service, which indicates to me that, that by law, uh, there's supposed to be a damage assessment conducted uh, by this compromise. That's by law. Anytime you have a compromise like this of information to a foreign intelligence threat, you have to do an evaluation of what damage was done. Uh, Jim Clapper, when he was ODNI uh, himself, was asked about why haven't you done a, a uh, damage assessment, and he just said, I just don't want to do it. I, I don't think, you know, that's a good answer. I don't. But it needs to be done. And I, I, again, I've said this to a number of, of members of Congress and the Senate on this. You, this is not a partisan issue. By law, when you have a compromise like this, it says in the law, you must do a damage assessment. So the first thing you got to do is do a da damage assessment. Secondly, there is other evidence the Chinese have been very effective in eating our lunch. We lost a number of assets back about 2011, 2012 in Beijing. We've never recovered from that. And there's other indicators the Chinese are very effective in their intelligence collection programs against us. So. I think we need to do a review of everything we're doing to figure out why the Chinese are so effective. So those are the things I think we should do based on this information. And again, I'm speaking, this, uh, speaking about this purely as an intelligence professional. Uh, you need to set aside the politics, whatever they are, and actually do the job of evaluating how this was compromised, what was compromised, and what the damage was uh, that, that came from this compromise. So, you know, this work that you do, you know, advising congressional members and so forth. Uh, that also speaks to your role as now the acting president at the London Center. Yes. Can you tell me a little more about what you do? Well, being the president is very distracting from getting work done, I'll say that for the record. Uh, what I normally do is, uh, as uh, the vice president for operations, uh, and I'm still doing it as a president, is I manage uh, a group of extraordinary uh, fellows male and female, who are masters of the practicing of their art of expertise or, of, or choosing. Uh, Sydney Powell, you interviewed Sydney Powell a few days ago. Sydney is a, an amazing woman who is an extraordinary litigator. She's a well-respected, a practitioner. Uh, one of my closest friends and colleagues, uh, who is one of our distinguished members of our board, is Bud McFarlane, the National Security Advisor to President Reagan. Um, Jim Wolsey, another extraordinary fellow, who um, distinguished fellow, who actually is one of the backbone of our organization. The, the common thread of the people that we have within our, our, our ranks and our purpose is practitioners. We are very big on examining practical 
issues from the perspective of what policies work. Uh, we don't deal well with theoretical, you know, uh, papers. You, you don't see us do a lot of papers because while we do have academics, uh, I publish editorials, your organizations are published on my editorials, we're very much into educating the public in a, a very academic and factual way. Uh, we deal primarily in fact, in fact relating to this process worked in the past. We believe if you adapt this process for this current challenge, the chances of success are pretty good. And I'd like to believe that if, if we're brought into a situation, uh, we were brought into Venezuela recently by certain senior leaders at the State Department, um, we're being brought in because they want to have practical answers which will result in some outcome uh, that is favorable to the national security interests of the United States. Very interesting. Well, so, and th this also speaks to my next question actually, which is, um, you know, personally, uh, you are involved as, you know, an advisor to the Trump 2020 campaign. Yes. And, um, you know, what inspired you to do this? That's an excellent question. Um, prior to President Trump's election, uh, we, uh, as practitioners of intelligence and um, uh, law enforcement, had seen a diminution, if you will, of a commitment by the federal bureaucracy to do the right thing. And I think uh, we talked today about the Russian narrative or Russian collusion investigation is an example of that, where uh, the bureaucracy I've seen a number of times, to include in my own issue of able danger of the 9-11 attacks, I've seen, I've seen personally cover-ups which would, you know, curl the hair of the American public. And, uh, I, you know, a lot of us were kind of tired of seeing the federal bureaucracy or the swamp being able to determine its own future by being per pretty much impervious to any oversight. And when President Trump rolled into town, uh, one of the extraordinary things about the man is uh, he actually went about keeping his political promises. And so uh, to me, you know, as someone who has seen the swamp go after people for purpose of trying to protect its own uh, uh, wrongdoing, uh, I was very buoyed by President Trump's election and then uh, him keeping his word. So when I was asked, I was asked in, uh, I, I believe it was November of, of uh, 20, uh, 2016, uh, a little over, yeah, a little over a year ago now, to join as an advisor to the campaign, I, I, I thought about it seriously. And um, based on the actions to, to that point in time of the president, I felt that joining that, the, the campaign as an advisor would be a good thing. And since then, uh, I, I've been gratified, and you can go on the president's Facebook page, I've been the one putting together uh, the national security policy uh, planks for his campaign. Uh, I've done a number of interviews with Laura Trump. They're available. And um, what I do appreciate about being on Trump 2020 is that uh, the London Center's fundamental philosophy is very Reagan-based. A lot of our fellows are very close to Reagan's thinking on national security. And as the advisor to the campaign, I advise them to do Reagan-type stuff. This is, not, this is not rocket science. This is actually examining what worked in the Reagan years, having uh, my colleagues and, and mentors are Reagan, you know, not many of them left, but the ones who are left, we work with very closely. And we try to, and so I try to impart the wisdom that I get from these folks into the campaign to say, hey, this is, this is what I think may be best regarding our national security. So uh, I, <clears throat> I have found that they've been completely receptive to what I believe to be common sense approaches. The president has seen uh, what I've done for his campaign and apparently he likes it because he allows it to be posted on his Facebook. So um, I've been uh, happily gratified that they actually do take my advice. And uh, just a word, you know, if you, if you ask me to advise you and uh, I show up and you don't want my advice, don't ask me to advise you. And I, I have been gratified by the fact these people are very open to the advice. And I'd like to believe the advice has been well applied in his foreign policy over the past year. Excellent. Well, Tony, thanks so much. Sure. Really appreciate speaking with you. Thank you. It's been a great, and I, I appreciate your organization and being on with you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.